Hello, and welcome to the Poetry Podcast with me, Lance Pearson. I've been a poetry lover all my life, since my mum read to me as a child. She was a professional actor, and now so am I. For the last 20 years or more, I have made performing poetry my speciality, because some people are kind enough to say they like it when I do. From my experience and my poetry recordings, I am putting out this podcast each month, and I hope you will enjoy listening as much as I do reading. There will always be one or more poems read by me, sometimes on their own, but more often with some comment and explanation. Every three or four episodes, I'll read a poem or poems that you request. All requests are welcome, the more the merrier, and I'll see what I can do. I'll give the contact address at the end of this first episode. I'm launching it with a programme on how poetry can help us through hard times. At the time when I'm recording this, the whole world is being shocked and rocked and stopped in its tracks by the coronavirus COVID-19, making us change the way we live. Lots of you will, of course, hear this programme much later on, when, I hope and pray, the virus will have been contained and neutralised and be a thing of the past. But hard times are bound to keep cropping up in one form or another, so I think these poems will remain an inspiration and a tonic over the months and years. They've all been around for hundreds of years already. I love modern poems as well, and in programme two we'll have some new ones. But I'm a great believer in poetry that has stood the test of time and proved itself a present help in trouble for generation after generation. We're starting with Shakespeare. Who else? And one of the most famous of all the speeches in his plays. Once more unto the breach, dear friends. The speaker is King Henry V, urging his troops on to capture the French town of Harfleur they've laid siege to. They have had no success so far. They have lost momentum. There is the real prospect that they will be driven back with serious loss of life. It is a challenging moment. Can Henry turn it round? This is terrific drama and terrific poetry. In a mere 34 lines, he will have you getting up out of your chairs or your headphones and cheering. There are words that have seeped into the very veins of English consciousness. Not just once more onto the breach, or the inviting hole that they've battered in the city wall, but as he begins to nerve himself and his friends for the fight, imitate the action of the tiger. Who could forget those words? And when he knows his oratory has worked its magic on the troops, I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, and the slips here being nothing to do with fielding and cricket, of course, but the leashes that hold hunting dogs till the moment it's time to let them leap forward. But I have to tell you one thing. I have never seen or heard this speech rightly understood and staged, <laughs> except by yours truly. Laurence Olivier, Kenneth Branagh, and everyone else get it wrong, I believe. They treat it as one long speech to the whole army, and so they deliver it as a loud rant that has already reached its climax in line one. It is a struggle to declaim, and a struggle to listen to. Tom Hiddleston adapts it well to the fact that he can't, no one can, sustain the volume and breath of the fortissimo start. But he shouldn't need to. I am indebted to Professor Jonathan Bate for showing that, in fact, the speech is clearly in three parts, addressed to three different groups. If you want to see this, 
The words for this and all this programme's poems are on our website. Now, the title is The Poetry Podcast with Lance Pearson. All one word. The Poetry Podcast with Lance Pearson. Funny spelling of Pearson. P-I-E-R-S-O-N dot com. In this speech, the king starts talking to his dear friends. And they are identified in the stage directions as the Duke of Exeter, who was his uncle, and the Dukes of Bedford and Gloucester, who were his brothers. In other words, the first 15 lines are spoken to just three people, his closest family circle, who share the direction of the battle with him. There's no need to shout, except as the sheer wizardry of the words work him up. Then he says, On, on, you noblest English! He turns to the noblemen who lead the different sections of the army. Finally, for the last ten lines, he says, And you, good yeomen! He gives his orders to the ordinary fighting men. Now is the time to shout, to be heard by them all. This performance of the speech tries to distinguish these three sections with music in between them. It comes from the show Shakespeare's Greatest Hits, which I toured for three years with my colleagues in the words and music trio in voice and verse. The pianist and musical arranger is Heather Chamberlain. Once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. In peace there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard-favoured rage. Then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let it pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow o'erwhelm it as fearfully as doth a galled rock o'erhang and jutty his confounded base, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide, hold hard the breath, and bend up every spirit to his full height. On, on, you noblest English, whose blood is fed from fathers of war-proof, fathers that, like so many Alexanders, have in these parts from morn till even fought and sheathed their swords for lack of argument. Dishonour not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood and teach them how to war. And you, good yeomen, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not, for there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start. The game's afoot! Follow your spirit, and upon this charge cry, God for Harry, England, and St. George! If you'd like to hear more of the Shakespeare's Greatest Hits show, the CD is still available. Details on the Poetry Podcast website. Our second poet is John Milton. 
He's not so fashionable today, but I'm sure he is our second greatest poet after Shakespeare. His great tragedy was that between the ages of 35 and 43, he went totally blind from a rare form of the eye disease, glaucoma. At the end of that process, he wrote his famous sonnet on his blindness. It must be bad enough to lose your sight, but for Milton there were two underlying factors that made it feel even worse. One was that on the face of it, it made his job impossible. He was a writer, uniquely gifted and equipped. He saw that as his one talent. He had put it at the service of Oliver Cromwell and England's Republican government after the Civil War. He was, in effect, the government's spin doctor, writing all its correspondence and propaganda with other countries in Latin, which was the universal language of diplomacy. Of all our English language poets, he was the one most involved in public affairs. And his work involved not just writing, but voluminous reading. No longer possible. But even more of a conflict was that he was a profoundly convinced Christian believer. God had made him a great writer. How could he now take away the ability to read and write? And beneath and beyond the day job of representing England to the world, he had a deeper, bigger ambition. Again, he firmly believed it was planted by God. And this was to represent not just England, but God himself to the world. There was in him an epic poem, Paradise Lost, to justify the ways of God to men. How could he write it now? His sonnet pours out his bewilderment and his anguish, and then, halfway through, it turns round and begins to answer him. It speaks back to him. God may have other ways to carry his purposes out. He is not defeated by the problems. Patience. Wait. Wait and see. When I consider how my light is spent, ere half my days in this dark world and wide, and that one talent which is death to hide lodged with me useless, though my soul more bent to serve therewith my Maker and present my true account, lest he returning chide. Oh, doth God exact day labour, light denied? I fondly ask. But patience, to prevent that murmur, soon replies, God doth not need either man's work, or his own gifts, who best bear his mild yoke. They serve him best. His state is kingly, thousands at his bidding, speed and post o'er land and ocean without rest. They also serve, who only stand and wait. Wait in both senses, await developments, and wait on God like a waiter in a restaurant, a servant. It turned out that with the help of amanuenses, people to read and write down the words for him, the government documents, 
and the epic poem, and others, did get written. Our third poet, William Cooper, hasn't the same great stature as the other two, but he too faced hard times and suggests a source of strength in his poem. Shakespeare wrote Henry V in the 16th century, Milton in the 17th, Cooper in the 18th. He lived in the Buckinghamshire village of Olney, where the vicar was the former slave trader John Newton, now campaigning against the slave trade. Cooper helped with anti-slavery poems, and together they wrote a new hymn each week for the church's midweek meeting. Newton wrote Amazing Grace. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds, and glorious things of thee are spoken, among many others. Cooper's last hymn is one of the most famous in the English language, whose opening line is quoted countless times round the world every day. But it was born out of intense suffering, because poor Cooper was at the mercy of fits of depression bordering at times on complete insanity. In 1773, he experienced his worst attack. Newton wrote in his diary, How mysterious are the ways of the Lord! He probably said it out loud, and prompted Cooper's response. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. And in the hymn, Cooper clings for dear life to the faith that God has a good purpose behind the battering storms of life. The hymn is always known by its opening lines, but Cooper gave it the title Light Shining Out of Darkness. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never-failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take, the clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace behind a frowning providence. He hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain.
Well, that's all for now, folks. If you enjoyed the program, or any later episodes, perhaps you could give it a rating or review on iTunes, or if you have one, your preferred podcasting app. And if you'd like to suggest a poem you'd like me to read, please leave a comment at the website the poetry podcast with Lance Pearson dot com or on our YouTube page. Hope to see you at program two when we shall have three or four more recent poems and less well known.